many of you know that I spent uh, several weeks at wildfires uh, throughout the summer uh, for two weeks at a time. And I did a lot of hard work, met a lot of really good people out there. Um, we, we worked together, we hung out together, we ate together, and developed some really good friendships and some bonds that you can develop when you're uh, working towards a common goal or experience a common hardship. And then I came back and got plugged back into my family and to the Whispering Pines family. And I realized I kind of let something about me fade during those times. I became content with the world, uh, complacent with how the world is. And when I came home, it was highlighted to me that my family and this church give me strength in my Christian walk. I could tell you for a fact that I wouldn't be here spiritually, probably physically at this church if it wasn't for my wife. And I definitely wouldn't be on this pulpit if it wasn't for you guys. You guys encourage me, inspire me, and support me, and you challenge me. And sometimes it's hard to feel it when you're immersed in it. You don't realize it, but when, at least when I step away from it, I realize that something's missing, and that's transforming fellowship. And I want to thank you all for helping me grow in my walk in Christ. So today we're going to be talking about transforming fellowship, what it is, why it's important, and what does it look like. So if you'll join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather. Uh, we, we love and adore you, and we know you are in control. Lord, I ask that you give me the ability to deliver your message truthfully and honestly, and I also pray that you will open our ears and soften our hearts so that we may hear your message and live your message. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, so transforming fellowship. So it seems kind of self-evident, but I'd like to break it down on what it means. So we'll start with the word transform. And just for the record, this could be a sermon series in itself, but I'm going to try to condense it down and keep it, keep it quick. <clears throat> so it's a change from the inside out. We're all aware of the caterpillar that turns into the butterfly. That's something that we can do spiritually, and we need to change from the inside out. That's transforming. Paul says in Romans, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So don't be content with the world. Don't be comfortable with how things are. Don't be satisfied with this world. This world is trying to threaten your relationship with Jesus. We need to transform our minds. We need to think differently. We need to consider and test what is before us. Every day we're challenged with something new. Every day we see some, some new situation or meet some person. We need to evaluate that, test that. Is it what God intended? Is it the will of God? Is it good? Is it acceptable? Is it perfect? When we start asking these questions in our daily life, we open our mind to the transformation God intended. This is how it starts. This is where our transformation starts. As your mind transforms, so will your life. Not only here on earth, but in the afterlife too. Paul testified to the Ephesians about the new life in Christ, and he challenged them to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through the deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So, he starts this message in Romans 2.12 about what not to do. 
not to be conformed with this world, to put off your old self. And then he tells us what to do, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Remember, it starts with our minds and the rest of us, and the rest of it will follow. And think about it, how, how exciting is it if you truly think to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness? What a great thing to aspire to. That's in our future. Don't think that it, we can't transform into that. That's going to happen. Let that give you hope and, and encouragement that we can transform into something that we're not currently. Someday we will be transferred into, transformed into something righteous and holy. But we need to think of new ways. And then we can meditate on the truths of God and contemplate a transformed existence. Do you guys remember Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus? That was a, that's a transformation. He went from persecuting Christians to giving his life for Christ. If we could all experience such a transformation, I think that would be amazingly, we'd be blessed by that. But let me encourage you that God loves you the way you are. He just wants you to be more like Jesus. All right, so the second part of transforming fellowship is fellowship. We weren't meant to do this alone, and it's a hard road, and we need help getting there. Jesus chose 12 disciples to spread the gospel. He didn't have to do that. He's the son of God. He could do anything he wants on his own, but he didn't. He chose 12 men to help him out. And I think it's because he understood the value of fellowship. Fellowship fosters love, encouragement, it provides accountability, and it provides a path for us. Jesus gave, a, gave us a new commandment with, when he was here on earth. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This has got to be important. Jesus made a new commandment, telling us to love one another. <clears throat> but the message of loving one another is not new. Um, we've heard it before, and it's throughout the Bible. But to love like Jesus loved his disciples, that's true love. Ask yourself this, do people know you are a disciple of Christ by observing your love for one another? I think that's, for me, a tough, tough question to answer. But we also need encouragement from one another. In Hebrews it says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. We need each other in this. We need to encourage one another. Christian perseverance is a community endeavor. And community encouragement towards perseverance requires us being together. It's that mutual exhortation, which means encouragement, that can sustain and strengthen our faith. This fellowship also provides accountability. The Old Testament says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone, and when he falls, has not another to lift him up. When we fall or slip or drift away, we need our fellow Christians to lift us up, to get us pointed in the right direction, to hold us accountable. It's, it's too easy to, to go astray when we're on our own. Just think about it. If we're on this journey, who's got our back? We need to have each other's back. Fellowship also provides a path to deeper fellowship with the Lord. So I'm going to read the opening verses of 1 John, and I want you to listen to two things. First is the plurality of the language that he uses. He uses we, our, us. And it demonstrates that he's not alone in spreading the gospel, that he's working together with other people. 
And second, I want you to listen for the message about human fellowship leading to divine fellowship. <clears throat> that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest. And we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The gospel message is meant to bind us together. We're in this together. And you can see that John has surrounded himself with others to spread the gospel. And he's telling us that there's a rich, uh, richer, deeper fellowship beyond the mere human fellowship that we experience right now. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. But to get there, we need each other. And fellowship with one another supports our fellowship with Jesus Christ. You may have heard it said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I believe we all have a long ways to go to get to the kingdom of Christ. So now I'd like to put those two concepts together, transforming fellowship, and take a look at that together. So we can use the power of community and fellowship to help us transform into the being God wants us to be. By developing deeper relationships in the church, we can enhance our relationship with God. <clears throat> these, got, these relationships make it easier, in, if not in some cases possible, to change our thinking so that we can renew the spirit in our minds, to put off our old self, to not be conformed to this world, and to put on a new self. If renewing our mind is the key to transformation and thinking differently and thinking differently and rightly gets us on our way to renewing our mind, are we going to do that in isolation? Are we going to do that alone? We're going to get there together. As you guys know, being a Christian is hard. And we need each other to stay on the path. God will use others in our lives to get to where we need to be. And that might surprise us, it might be painful, it might be a known blessing. But I also want you to know that God will use us to get others to where they need to be. So be open for that. Be ready for that. So of course, we're talking about a value here at Whispering Pines Church, transforming fellowship. We already exhibit this quality. This is who we are. So why am I telling you this? Why is it important that we understand what transforming fellowship is? Because this value is also aspirational. We're not necessarily there yet. We can do better. We should want to do better, especially if we understand how important it is. I want you guys to take a, a moment and look around to the folks around here. Online, you guys, think about the folks that are that are here regularly. These are the people you need to lift up. These are the people you need to support. You need to teach. You need to hold accountable. And you need to encourage. But that's not it. That's not only it. These are also the people you can draw strength from, who will offer forgiveness, provide unconditional love, and show you what Christ looks like. You need these people. And they need you. Our Christian walk depends on it. Here at Whispering Pines, we uh, have further defined the, the idea of transforming fellowship as we believe in the transforming power of an intimate Christian community through unity in the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we foster opportunities for everyone to connect and grow in their walk with God personally and as a congregation. So when you hear that, remember, it's aspirational. There's more to do. 
We need to foster opportunities to grow in our walk. And it's a continuous process that never ends. So seek out others to develop and grow yourself and others. So what does this look like? Well, I can tell you it looks a lot different during a pandemic. <laughs> um, it's, it's requiring a lot more creativity now. It's gonna require a little more intentional effort on our parts to provide that, those transforming fellowship moments. It's easy to have a potluck uh, breakfast, but right now we're not doing that. So we're, we're gonna have to dig a little deeper and figure out how we can maintain our transforming fellowship. But it starts with attending church. So you guys are doing it now. You're doing it online, thank you. But you're attending church not to just check off a box, and you're certainly not here just to listen to me. If you're online attending church, I really encourage you to use the chat function if you're on that platform. Don't let it be a passive experience. There are other people online with you. Reach out to them during the service. Offer each other encouragement. Let them know you're there. Be active in your participation. And so us being here or being active online is just not for our benefit. It's for the benefit of others as well. I can tell you how encouraging it is for me when I come to church and I see others here. I don't think in terms of like, well, good thing I'm here because people want to see me here. It, it doesn't work that way. I, you guys bring me so much encouragement when, when I see other people here. I'm not, I know I'm not alone in this. I would encourage you guys to invite somebody new to church, maybe a, a, somebody you just met or a neighbor. You might be the catalyst God put in their life. I encourage you to invite a fair weather friend that comes kind of sporadically. Just be a bug in their ear. Get them to come to church. I also encourage you guys to stay for fellowship. It looks a lot different than it has been, and we're trying to make it work with food trucks. We've spent a lot of money and energy to, to make the fellowship hall a more inviting place. But it's, it's, a, it's a great place to make connections and deepen your relationship with each other. But I'd encourage you to make it transformational, not just social. In, introduce yourself to somebody new. Sit and eat in a different circle. Don't tell the governor that, though. <laughs> but I'm encouraging you to meet with other people and expose yourself to other people. And I'd like to ask you to open yourself readily. This means being vulnerable. And there's no intimate Christian community without you being open and a bit vulnerable. Now, I realize we may gravitate to uh, people that we know, people that we identify with that seem more like ourselves, but I want to remind you guys, we are all unified in Christ, regardless of our age, our race, background, political views. So please reach out to other folks outside your circle. Now, some of the other ways it looks is being engaged in small groups. At Whispering Pines here, we are blessed with a lot of small groups. That includes, now, I, uh, I'll make the caveat, once again, it does look different. Many of our groups now are meeting online or on hold, but that's not gonna last forever. And so I'm asking you to have patience until it gets kicked into in-person. I'd ask you to flex onto Zoom, and I, I realize we're all tired of that, but, but it's important that we stay engaged with each other. But we have a prayer group. We have Sunday school. We have Saturday women's study. We have Saturday men's breakfast. We have a women's Bible study that meets out in the parking lot in the wind. We have men's Bible study that's on hold right now. Yep. We, we've got uh, home fellowship. There's a fellowship hiking group that you can join anytime once a week. There's a youth group. We do Power Zone. We do VBS in the, in the summertime. And you can start your own group, and we encourage you to do so. There's all kinds of activities, like Secret Sisters, and building ornaments, and packing boxes, and Christmas tree lightings. These are all ways 
to engage in transforming fellowship. So please take advantage of them, use them. Some of you might know people that were regular attendees at church, then they missed a couple Sundays, no big deal. Then they missed some more, and then you didn't see them at the regular study group. And then you just kinda, they just kinda faded away, and they just disappeared. And then maybe you make contact with them again, for some reason, you run into them at the quick mart, like, oh, where you been? It's kinda, you kinda wonder where they are in their Christian walk. My guess is, they haven't had the transformational fellowship that we experience when we're together and might be a little lost on their walk. Those might be good people to reach out to. During this pandemic, a lot of people are feeling isolated. This is a very important time to reach out to them. Find ways to provide that transforming fellowship in safe ways. Let them know you're out there. Stay connected with them. Considering folks you've just lost contact with for a while, have a, pick up the phone, give them a call. Those phone calls out of the blue make a difference. And when they know Christ is behind that phone call, I think that's very, very powerful, impactful. I'd also like to encourage you to connect with other Christians that are maybe outside this Whispering Pines group. When you're at work, there's got to be other Christians out there, and sometimes it's some secret underground club that nobody wants to talk about at work. Find them. Talk about the Lord. I think you will find a lot of strength and encouragement from that when you find those, those folks outside of this circle in your more or less secular life. It doesn't have to be compartmentalized. It ought to be part of your full life. So I'd like to conclude with the closing comments Paul made in 2 Corinthians. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Mm -hmm.